Hi, I'm Dr. Heather Cox, and today we're going to be doing an examination of the peripheral pulses. Um, the examination of the peripheral pulses is generally part of the cardiovascular exam and any screening exam for a patient you're meeting for the first time. Today we'll be reviewing an examination of the upper extremity, the lower extremity, and how to perform an ABI. The importance of this examination helps you understand whether or not the patient may have risk factors for cardiac disease or atherosclerosis. And it also will help you inform how well the patient may do with a given diagnosis. So the examination of the upper extremity involves the examination of all the peripheral pulses of the arm. It's important to examine all levels as a patient can have occlusive proximal disease and still have a palpable pulse at the level of the wrist. And that is because the arm, unlike the leg, collateralizes so well. The points that we'll be looking at today will be the subclavian, the axillary, the brachial, the radial and the ulnar. So to do the examination, expose the patient discreetly. The subclavian pulse is found at the junction of the clavicle and the humerus. And it will be felt there. The examination of the axillary artery involves slight rotation of the arm and a medial approach to the, the bicep tendon. Lower the arm slightly and get a little bend in the antecubital fossa, and on the medial side of the bicep tendon, you will find the brachial artery. And at the level of the wrist, you palpate the ulnar and the radial. The radial is most commonly palpated in most offices and on TV shows, but the ulnar artery is actually the one that supplies most circulation to the arm. Lastly, on some internal medicine examinations in cardiology, the carotid pulse is part of the peripheral exam. This is not typical for surgery, however. The carotid pulse can be felt, here I will demonstrate on this side, at the junction of the sternocleidomastoid. And bruies are heard by placing your stethoscope using the diaphragm portion gently there. Ask the patient to hold his breath, and is clearly heard. That's the examination of the upper extremity. The examination of the peripheral pulses of the lower extremity starts at the level of the abdomen and goes down to the ankle. We will examine the aorta, the femoral, the popliteal, the dorsalis pedis, and the posterior tibial artery. For examination of the aortic pulse, place your hands one finger breadth above the umbilicus. The aorta runs along the midline and the visceral segment is given off above the umbilicus. Push down gently, and in thin patients, you will feel a normal aortic pulse. In a patient with an aneurysm, you will feel a fullness or a wideness that you can palpate on either side. The examination of the lower extremity begins for examination for the presence or absence of the pulse, the quality of the pulse, and the presence or absence of the peripheral aneurysm. The femoral is felt halfway between the anterior superior iliac spine, or ASIS and the pubic rami. Halfway there is the palpable femoral pulse. To examine the popliteal, ask the patient to bend the knee slightly and externally rotate the hip. Place both your hands, your second, third, and fourth fingers of both hands behind the popliteal fossa or the knee and lean back you should be able to feel the, pul the popliteal artery if it is normal. This is one of the most challenging pulses for anyone to feel. Then have the patient lower the leg and move towards the feet. The posterior tibial is one finger breadth behind the medial malleolus of the limb. And the dorsalis pedis is on the dorsum of the foot just medial to the extensor halysis. These pulses are typically felt with the same three fingers as the popliteal and the femoral. Completion of the peripheral examination of the lower limb does include a Doppler exam. Most offices and emergency departments do have a handheld Doppler. It does require a surface between the Doppler and the skin and gel is typically used. If you're using gel that belongs to multiple uses of patients, put the gel on your finger first and then on the patient, as opposed to directly on the patient to avoid contamination.
given that we've already palpated the pulse, we know where the pulse should be, and that's where the gel is placed. To start the Doppler, most have a power button, and they also have a volume button. So if you hit the power button and don't hear anything, most commonly, it's the volume that's not up. You typically want to be 60 degrees from the pulse to have the best signal. It's important to feel comfortable to move the Doppler around the limb until you are comfortable that you are feeling the pulse at its loudest portion. You're listening for the presence of the pulse, the way in which the pulse falls, the frequency, for example, is there atrial fibrillation, and its presence. The same thing is repeated for the dorsalis pedis. For the purposes of the camera, I will rotate the limb, but you can have the patient in, it's in the patient's most comfortable position. Often, students want to examine the peripheral pulse of the dorsalis pedis out at the most distal portion, but really its signal is best heard around the level of the ankle on the dorsum of the foot. So again, 60 degrees, and wait till you hear it at its fullest portion. You want to use something to stabilize your hand so that it doesn't move. For myself, I just place my fifth finger on the patient's foot, but you can also hold your wrist to minimize any small movements. And that is the examination of the lower extremity. Now we'll complete the examination of the ankle brachial index, or commonly called the ABI. The ABI involves comparing the systolic pressure felt at the level of the arm to that of the ankle, and it represents the amount of flow that the foot theoretically is seeing. Technically, an ABI starts with taking a standard systolic blood pressure with your stethoscope and your cuff. Um, we've performed that already in this patient. To do the ABI, you'll take the brachial pulse with the Doppler. And in the arm, it's important to distinguish an arterial from a venous signal. So this is an arterial signal. You can hear the pulse. And you want to make sure that this is not mistaken for a venous signal. I will attempt to, to demonstrate. This is a venous signal, which most commonly is the brachial vein. It does overlie the artery in many thin patients, and you have to make sure that you don't mistake this signal for the pulse. A venous signal generally can be interrupted with um, gently squeezing the muscle belly below the vein, whereas an arterial signal cannot. So back to the arterial signal. millimeters of mercury above their systolic blood pressure and slowly bring it down until you hit the pulse again. That is your brachial signal. Then the cuff is moved down to the patient's ankle. An ABI is a specific measurement for each leg. That means that the ABI and the cuff pressure has to be taken in each leg in the dorsalis pedis and the posterior tibial. That means that you will actually get four numbers for your examination of the ABI of the lower part of the extremity. The cuff is placed generally just above the ankle as that's where it tends to fit most patients accurately. There you go. 
Again, I already have jelly on the patient's limb, as that's our interface between the Doppler and the patient's pulse. You find the patient's pulse, and this is where it's crucial that you try not to move your hand. The cuff is insufflated until you lose the signal, and then deflated, and when the signal returns, that is the pressure for the posterior tibial in this patient on the left leg. This is similarly repeated for the dorsalis pedis. this left-handed, but normally it would be with my right hand, as I am right-handed. Insufflate the cuff again until you lose a signal. Wait till it returns. And that number is now the ankle pressure for the dorsalis pedis of the left leg. The exact same examination is repeated for the patient's right, and then I will demonstrate how we actually calculate the ankle brachial index. So this is how we calculate the ankle brachial index. What I've represented here is the patient's right arm and the patient's left arm values. This is the systolic blood pressure, SBP, the posterior tibial, PT, and the dorsalis pedis, DP. What calculates the ankle brachial index is that you want to take the highest ankle pressure for each leg. So in the right leg, 113 would be the number used. And for the left leg, 115 is the number used. You want to take that over the highest systolic pressure from either arm. So in this case, the ankle brachial index for the right leg will be the ankle value 113 over the highest systolic, 115. For the left leg, the highest ankle pressure is 115 over the highest arm pressure of either arm, 115. So the pressure on the left is 1.0 and on the right is 0.98. Both of these values are considered normal. I highlight for the medical student that the denominator for the left and the right leg should be the same. That is a common error. Students want to take the systolic pressure for each arm and use that as the denominator. That is incorrect. The denominator should be the same for each leg because each leg is reflecting the pressure from one heart. So normal is considered anything from 0.9 to 1.4. You will see values greater than 1.4 in anyone that has a calcified vessel. That would be your elderly patients, potentially your diabetic patients, chronic renal insufficiency, or chronic renal failure. When the value is lower than 0.9, that represents generally atherosclerotic disease because the leg is not seeing the full amount of blood flow that it should be seeing. When we see values of 0.4 or less, we worry about patients having critical limb ischemia, and certainly in values of 0.2 or less, we are very concerned about gangrene and risk of limb loss and need for amputations. So to summarize today, we examined the peripheral pulses of the extremity. For the upper extremity, we examined the carotid pulse, the subclavian, the axillary, the brachial, the radial, and the ulnar. And for the lower pulses, we examined the aortic pulse, the femoral, the popliteal, the dorsalis pedis, and the posterior tibial. The examination of the peripheral pulse is very quick to do and relatively easy, but the information that you gain from it is crucial for the management of your patients. It is very important that it is performed and performed accurately. The examination of the peripheral pulse also gives you information in a critical situation in which a patient is coding. 
You have multiple places in which to examine a, the pulse, the radial, the femoral, the carotid, as a way for you to be a meaningful contributor to the running of that code.